You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, God damn it! Get the point good. And now... Fendo. Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. Hey there, hi there, ho there, and happy wacka 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 doodle Wednesday to y'all. It is a windy wacka doodle Wednesday out here in Grammy land. It is quite blustery, and bless their hearts, I have people roofing this old place, and uh, yeah, putting tin roof on in this kind of wind, they are earning their keep today, let me tell you. Whee! I'm glad they're doing it though. I'm glad it's them and not me. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. I've been out in the wind too, by the way. Been over at my uncle's painting fence and holy shit. I thought, yeah, it wouldn't take me long to paint that fence. <laughs> I got half of one side done. <laughs> shit. So yeah, I go back tomorrow, do some more painting, and probably the next day, and the next day, just to get that dang thing done. Holy carp. And the wind, yeah. Hello, pollen. Oh well. So, over here on Twitter, thank you Vinny, and RLM, and Barman, and and JJ's, and who else? Um, all kind of people. Yes, it is a happy wacky Wednesday, Grim. Or was that? Oh, that's Cowboy. Hi, Cowboy. How you doing, hon? Hope you're having an absolutely splendiferous day. Okay, um, let's see. Deplorable Mike just posted this. Don't tell me how to live my life. Please don't leave dead hookers in our bathroom. Oh, my God. That's a that's a gas station sign. Wow. <laughs> All righty. Thanks there, Deplorable Mike. That, woo. Excellent, excellent advice. Yeah, don't lo- leave dead hookers. Mmm. And if you le- if you leave the other kind of hookers, you know them kind that you put on the end of a string, on the end of a pole that you go out fishing with. Yeah, somebody's gonna step on that and it's gonna leave a mark. So, uh, over here on Twitter, let's see. All kind of people are just busy, busy, busy. And thank you once again, Barman, and all the other places that are posting me out there be sure if you're listening in on the Spreaker channel to come on over to reallibertymedia.com channel 10 if you wish to listen in on RLM or you can continue listening in on Spreaker that's awesome too but I can't chat with you in Spreaker so if you want to give me some static think of a nickname join the chat have a little fun there's lots of people in there that are way cool just saying So, oh my goodness, there's all kind of people that are... Hi, Tenacious V-Bot. How are you doing, sweetheart? Hope you're having an absolutely splendiferous wackadoodle Wednesday. Scottish and socialist mum and grandma lives in organized chaos. (laughs) I understand. Rally, I do. Okay, um, I got a, I can't remember what it was that I posted. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, I shared something, and apparently I'm getting a lot of traction with it over on Twitter. It's a picture of Putin, and he says, influenced election? You mean like encouraging illegal immigrants to vote? <laughs> yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Well, hmm, <laughs> busted oh man somebody's sharing craft mac and cheese no that is not golden goodness honey make your own mac and cheese from scratch okay it's way better a lot less chemicals okay i'm gonna go ahead and shut down twitter because yeah there's a freaking pope and no nah. does pope shit in the woods only if you tie him up out there <clears throat> did i say that out loud yes i did okay over here on mines all kind of people censorship sucks is trying to get people to copy and paste something that he put out there on the main feed sorry hon that's kind of like a um you know those chain letter things and i just don't do them i get all these lovely messages over on facebook oh i love you i had an x-ray today and i found you in my heart please share this with uh, no no 
Because, I mean, I love you dearly, hon, for sending it to me. I truly do. But, God, bless America. Please stop sending me those stupid little chain letter things. Oi. Yes, I know. We should be thinking about this. We should be doing that. We should be. You should, you should, you should, you should. Shoulda, woulda, coulda, dudda. Da, 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 da. So, over here on Minds, lots of people are posting all kinds of weird weird stuff. Oh, hey, did you know a negative mind will never give you a positive life? That is true. That is true. Okay, moving from Minds over to this effing site. Hey, Grimmy, thank you, darling, for sharing this. I really do appreciate it. Grimmy just shared it over there on that effing site as well that, yeah, I'm live. Yay. And I had to log back in again. I don't know why I even had it remembering me, but I still had to log back in. Whatever. Keep calm and watch the takeover. Yeah. That's right, cowboy. Uh, activity marked as favorite. Well, that's cool. I'm glad it's marked as favorite. Yay. Um, let's see. I also see Cowboy Tech is over here as well as Katie Troxel was here and Mjutter Suits and uh, me. Yeah, no, don't do Subway. Don't do Subway. Actually, once I got a taste of Jimmy John's, it's like, nah. Although I don't get Jimmy John's very often because I don't eat out very often. But man, if I get, I love Jimmy John's bread. Something about it. It's just, yeah, I like Jimmy John's bread. So, okay, moving on. Moving on. Over here on Fakey Book. Hi, Linda. How are you doing? Yes, I can read it. How many of my friends pay attention to what I post? Not very many, honey, because Facebook doesn't like to let you do that kind of stuff. And just so as you know, I got a link that I found, I believe, over on Twitter. And I think Barman actually posted it. But I will get to that here in just a little bit. It's from about Fakey Book. And yeah, Fakey Book is, yeah. Yeah. Well, I get notifications from my family. That's pretty much it. Pretty much. Okay, moving along, moving along. Over here on RLO, reallibertymedia.org. Once again, Barman and Grim, thank you for sharing me over there. I really do appreciate it, you guys. I also see the lovely Mary B is posting stuff. And uh, looks like Java Doctor is doing stuff over here as well as Rob Works and Cowboy Tech. And let's see, how many other people are... Well, there's people that have been logged in, but some of them are not playing recently. And that's okay. Uh, the difference between a flower and a weed is judgment. Yes. Yes. I will agree. Actually, weeds are just merely what I was told a long time ago. They're just uninvited guests. Uh, ah, kindness. What a simple way to tell another struggling soul that there is love to be found in this world. Yes, there is. It's just that sometimes, <laughs> well, let's don't go there, okay? Because my mind is thinking all kinds of naughty things, and I'll just, I'll just stay away from that. Um, okay, Amelia. Let's go over to your well, poo. I wanted to go to her page because she shares all kinds of way cool stuff. Uh, da, da. She was sharing really cool stuff earlier. Where is she? Where are you, Amelia? I know you're on here somewhere. There you are. From the UK. Loved those turquoise tannies, hon. Okay, where was that at? Run away, run away. Okay. I need to get this out before I say hey to everybody in the chat. Amelia shared this, and yeah, yeah. There's no such thing as a man-made law. There are only rules and regulations that apply to consenting members of a particular society. Anyone can create a membership club and assign a series of rules. That in no way gives them the authority to force them on non-consenting people just minding their own business. The society to which government assign their rules is no more than a glorified membership club. Its rules have no inherent authority other than the degree to which they can intimidate others to obey them with the threat 
of their monopoly on force. You have the sovereignty. You always have. The illusion of centralized government or governance is no longer working. And so we see the last-ditch attempts of authoritarians to consolidate what remaining self-proclaimed power they think they have. Well said, Amelia. Well said. Now, over here to reallibertymedia.com channel 10. Hey guys, how you doing? Right up top I see Barman, the most splendiferous bot in the whole wide world. Don't you know? I also see Cowboy Tech is following right behind him, probably waiting for that sarsaparilla that Barman was supposed to bring him like 10 minutes ago. I also see Grimner, the RLM god, is here, as well as the lovely Moose Girl and the lovely Kate, who I believe dodged a uh, weather bullet. It looks like it's going to the Carolinas. Not so cool. Uh, Vinny, Vinny Schwaz. <laughs> 108 shoes. Vinny, you're weird. You're just weird, honey, but that's okay. We love you anyway. Uh, let's see. Who else is here? Ah, Phantom is here. The guy that did my awesome intro. Thank you once again, Phantom. You are the bomb. I also see Anti is logged in, as well as Asmo and the lovely Beth Z. Chalsa Denis is here, as well as Chloe. And Colfax 101, Cyborg Noodle, the bot that touches you with his noodly goodness, is here, as well as D underscore C, Dakota Frumpt. <laughs> Frumped, you're so funny. You're so funny. I'm here, as well as Gromit and Ibi Don C. Java, 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 Java Doctor, as well as Java Doctor 2. We got the new and improved version as well. Damn, double bonus round. JJ's, I hope you're feeling better, JJ's. I understand sometimes when you're feeling a little bit under the weather. And that's, I was kind of when I got home this afternoon, but I just kind of pulled up my big girl panties and um oh thank you ever so much cowboy tech for that root beer actually what i'm drinking right now is a ginger beer and it's quite tasty mm, num, num, num. okay uh <laughs> I also see Juana Taco is here, as well as Kozu, Layer 8, and Meister Bra. Hey, Woody. How you doing, hon? Moy, 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 moy. And we got a trifecta of poxes in the chat. Pox, pox, poxified, and poxophone. Also got a pop, a pop, a pond sauce, as well as the lovely rain. Please, Rain, I love you dearly, but don't fall until I get a chance to get some mowing done. Because, yeah, I got rain upon rain upon rain upon rain. And then, now I got wind, and guess what? Weeds grow when you get that much rain. I need to mow really bad. I also see RLM Fluke, the Vanna White of the RLM channel. Yes, Tenacious. Oh, thanks, Vanny. <laughs> I saw 108. <laughs> See? Perspective. Thank you for clarifying that, sweetheart. Wonderful life lesson there. You know, we all see something just a little bit different, and I truly appreciate the clarification. Sometimes, you know, people just don't, they get all butt hurt or whatever and don't ask for a clarification or, you know, um, don't offer a clarification and so it's nice when adults yes Vinny I called you an adult <laughs> be adult the world needs more adults <laughs> TD Sanders hi TD how are you doing woman okay yeah and I also see yeah Rob works is here and I saw him fire up the bubbler as well as sock puppet hey sock how you doing hon he also dodged one uh, trust no one is here and to round out the crew the one the only now that I know how to say it Vinny Tenacious is here yay yay he's so tenacious oh well there you go Vinny good job so let's see where do I want to go first oh yeah Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. 
Did you know that today, today I give everyone or give thanks to everyone who's been part of my life's journey? And you know what? Thank you, Amelia, for sharing that over here on realliberty.org. I, too, give thanks to everyone who's been part of my life's journey because you have all taught me something. Sometimes it's not necessarily what you intended to teach me because I'm I'm kind of um, obnoxious like that. <laughs> but I learn a lesson from every one of you. So, okay, moving along. Let's go get to this fakey book thing. It's from thinkprogress.org. Facebook's idea of fact checking. <clears throat> Censoring Think Progress because conservative sites told them to. Ah, mm hmm. It's almost Snope esque. Almost. Apparently, last year, Facebook announced that it would partner with the Weekly Standard, a conservative magazine, to fact check news articles that are shared on Fakeybook. At the time, Think Progress expressed alarm at this decision. The Weekly Standard has a history of placing right-wing ideology before accurate reporting. Among other things, it labeled the Iraq War as a war to be proud of. Uh, no, there is no such critter as a war to be proud of. Nah, no. Any war that you engage in is going to produce more of what you say you're supposedly going to war to extinguish. <clears throat> Yeah, we'll get to that, too, here in a minute. But, apparently they said that in 2005, and it ran an article in 2017 labeling climate science as uh, dataist science. Is that how you say that? Or data, dataist? I have no idea. And promoted that article with the phrase, look under the hood on climate change science. And what you see isn't pretty. Well, that's true. What you see is not pretty when it comes to climate change science. Yeah, it's not really science, honey. Not really. So, the Weekly Standard brought its third-party fact-checking power to bear against Think Progress on Monday when the outlet determined that Think Progress story about the Supreme Court nominee Brent Kavanaugh um, was false a category defined by fakey book to indicate the primary claims in this content are factually inaccurate. Well, you know, they might have an awful lot of facts. It's just the way they arranged them. Now, the article in question, which this reporter wrote, pointed out that when you read a statement Kavanaugh made, excuse me, during his confirmation hearing, alongside a statement he made in 2017, it becomes clear that he is communicating that he opposes Roe versus Wade. Now, our article is factually accurate, and the Weekly Standard's allegation against us is wrong. Well, once again, you know, they, they shared their opinion, you shared yours. Why should we keep either one out of the view, purview of the public? I think both opinions need to be out there. Just so people can get all of that information and decide for themselves. So, uh, they are, there are serious consequences for publishing an article that one of Fakey Book's third-party fact-checkers decrees to be false. You know, maybe you might have more people going to check out your article simply because fake book said, eh, wrong answer. So everybody's going to go, oh, well, if Facebook don't like it, I'm going to check it out. I know that's how I decide on what movie I'm going to see. You know, if, if you've got all of these uh, Siskel and Ebert-esque kind of people going, thumbs down, thumbs down, movie sucked, odds are I'm going to see it. And if they give it rave reviews, odds are I'm not even going to watch it on Netflix. <laughs> so, yeah, when when something gets rave reviews, most of the time I just kind of go, are you curious? Yeah, I don't think so. In any case, as Facebook CEO Mark Suckyberg recently wrote in a Washington Post, we demote posts rated as false, which means that they lose 80% of their future traffic. And see, I think that is 
wrong to do that. That is censorship. That is showing bias. Let people decide for themselves. That's why people's bullshit meters are not functioning properly because somebody out there is always going, oh, well, I know what's best for you. You should listen to me. Your bullshit meter you don't need that anymore. I'll be feeding you the real stuff. So when an article is labeled false under Fakiebook's third-party fact-checking system, groups that share that article on Fakiebook receive a notification informing them that the article received a false rating and that pages and websites that share this piece will see their overall distribution and their ability to monetize and advertise removed. Once again, censorship. Now, I do have to put this out there. Fakey Book is a corporation. It is a for-profit business. And they're not charging you up front, the general public, they aren't charging you up front to be able to have access to that system that they provide for you. But you need to understand there are hidden costs, just like hidden taxes. One hidden tax is, or tax is inflation. That is a hidden tax. Another hidden tax, which is really not quite as hidden as inflation, is um, traffic codes and the lovely little um, money machine that benefits from them. Yeah, that's a tax. It's a tax on people that wish to use motorized vehicles to, in order to go from one place to another. It is a tax. And it is a use of force. Most people don't see it that way, but it is. So, and most people don't drive like idiots and assholes. So, do you really need that many popo out there going, you know, you're going two mile an hour over speed limit. I'm going to have to nail you for a $75 speeding ticket for two miles an hour? <laughs> Holy shit. Speedometers have a three mile an hour leeway either direction just with the programming on these newer ones don't give me that shit the inflation of your tires can make that much of a difference assholios and yet they do it why because they have a badge and a little little book that says i can write on this piece of paper and give it to you and say you owe me 75 dollars damn talk about a racket in any case moving along so Fakie Book's notification regarding our piece on Kavanaugh and Roe v. Wade effectively warned outlets not to share Think Progress content or risk censorship themselves, which is possibly what's going on with my Fakie Book account, because I share stuff from them. <laughs> oh, well. Now, one group emailed Think Progress after receiving this notification to say that it found it threatening, which, yes, it is. Think Progress re reached out to Fakie Book for comment on its third-party fact-checking program and did not receive a response before this story was published. Now, the definition of the word say, S-A-Y, after Fakie Book sent the push notification stating that our article received a false rating, Think Progress reached out to Fakie Book, taking issue with the fact-check. A Fakie Book employee responded by email that Fake Book defers to each independent fact checker's process and publishers are responsible for reaching out to the fact checkers directly to request, request a correction. Well, if you don't know who the actual fact checker is, how in the hell are you supposed to contact them? You contact Fakie Book because that is the application that you're using. That sounds like a dodgy kind of excuse to me. But the editors at the Weekly Standard do not appear to be interested in correcting their fact check. No, because they have the power. The Weekly Standard's fact check appears to hinge on the definition of the word said. Kavanaugh cited in his confirmation hearing that a uh, Glucksburg test which refers to Washington v. Glucksburg, or a 1997 Supreme Court decision establishing that the Constitution does not protect a right to physician-assisted suicide. Now, under Glucksburg, 
Courts should determine which rights are protected by the Constitution by asking which rights are deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition. I got to call bullshit on that whole thing because the Constitution ain't there to protect any rights. Constitution, if you listen to what they what it was supposed to do, what we were taught that it was supposed to do, it was not protecting your rights. It was a limitation on the government. And the government went, we got a free pass. It's not like anybody's going to read this shit. Not even the people that voted in. Now, Kavanaugh <clears throat> also said in 2017 that even a first-year law student could tell you that the Glucksburg approach to unenumerated rights was not consistent with the approach to abortion cases such as Roe v. Wade as well as a 1992 decision reaffirming Roe, known as Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which Planned Parenthood is a whole other ballywick of bullshit-itis. They are making money hand over fist, and most of it is not from the actual abortions itself. It's from what stems from what they collect when they provide those abortions. Note, I said stems from. That's your little clue right there. Now, our article also cited law professors Jim Oleski and Jamal Green, both of whom re uh, reached similar conclusions regarding Kavanaugh's embrace of Glucksburg. The Weekly Standards piece labeling the piece false provides no analysis of this argument. It merely asserts that our article does not provide evidence that Kavanaugh said he would kill Roe v. Wade. Now I'm going to have to read it to see if he actually said he would kill Roe v. Wade. You can interpret things however you wish. Hell, I interpret and misinterpret all the time. It's what I do. Now, according to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, the verb say or said can mean to indicate, show, or communicate an idea. Our argument is that Kavanaugh indicated, showed, or communicated his intention to overrule Roe when he endorsed the Glucksberg test after saying that Glucksberg is inconsistent with Roe. Wow, reading a lot into that. Indicated, showed, communicated his intention. Well, you know, if you listen to Comey, apparently intention is irrelevant. Or maybe that's just in reference to Shillery. Whatever. Now, the Weekly Standard is one of only five outlets that enjoys the power to fact check other, people, other people's work on Fakie Book. The other four are the Associated Press and three outlet outlets that specialize in fact-checking, such as factcheck.org, PolitiFact, and Snopes. Ah! <laughs> Snopes, that's funny. No left-leaning outlet has this ability to fact-check other writers' works. What do you call Snopes? Seriously? <laughs> it is to laugh. So, to become a fakie book fact checker, an or an outlet must complete a verification process managed by an international fact checking network, or IFCN, at the Pointer Institute. Pointer. Hmm. Now, last November, F IFCN determined that Weekly Standard was only a partial compliance with its standards, though the IFCN's November report on the Weekly Standard indicated that the conservative news site eventually was likely to meet the IFCN standards. It also determined that the current version of the Weekly Standard's operation has existed for only three weeks, and the IFCN calls for three months of consistent fact-checking before it recognizes as a distinct unit. Yada, 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 blah, da, blah, da, blah, da, blah. Now, the fact check needs to build up a larger sample of work in order to stabilize and be fully assessed in its current form, according to IFCN's November report. Nevertheless, Fakie Book approved the weekly standard as one of its fact checking partners in early December. 
Why? Because they can, because they're a corporation and they're allowing you to use their site for whatever, even if you just want to take pictures of what you're having for supper, that's fine. Or if you want to do a duck face selfie, whatever, you can use their site, but look for those hidden costs. It appears that the Weekly Standard has added to Fakebook's roster of fact-checking outlets as part of a deliberate effort to pander to conservatives. Oh, and Snopes isn't a deliberate effort to pander to people that don't know doodly squat? Yeah. Apparently, the source told the news outlet Quartz that Fakeybook's partnership with the Weekly Standard was part of an effort to appease all sides. In other words, you've got someone that's extremely left-leaning, you've got someone that's extremely right-leaning, and then you've got a couple of them in there that weeble wobble all the time. I think that's pretty much a balanced system. You need to have five fact-checkers, or you need to have an odd number, so in case you have some kind of vote going on, you always have one that's a tiebreaker. As if I need to give Fakey Book one more excuse to get another fact checker to tell you, oh, you're full of shit. Well, you know what? I posted something about Nostradamus a couple weeks ago where Nostradamus was calling out all of these bullshit memes. And I never once got flagged for fact checking as in this is not an accurate meme. Never once. <laughs> Apparently, earlier this year, Fakey Book hired Republican Senator John Kyle of Arizona to lead an audit of alleged liberal bias at the expense of conservative voices at the social media juggernaut. Kyle, according to Vice, was regularly ranked among the country's most conservative senators when he served from 1995 to 2013. And he was recently appointed to serve out the remainder of Senator John McBain's term in office. So, shortly after Fakeybook hired Kyle to determine whether the site has a liberal bias, the Trump White House tapped Kyle to act as Judge Kavanaugh's Sherpa through his confirmation process. Well, yippee skippy. So, if Fakeybook continues its partnership with the Weekly Standard, the consequences could be quite severe for left-leaning outlets generally. Aw, how's it feel to get a little bit of your own back? Or potentially for any other outlet that publishes a news article that the Weekly Standard disagrees with. Aw, how does it feel to get a little of your own back? How many times do people get bullshit called on them because Snopes went, Oh no, that's not, no. No. Yeah, Snopes. A guy, a girl, and a cat. And I'll bet you the cat does the research. In any case, it's no secret that the digital news business is driven by clicks. And a news site that brings in many readers will also bring in a great deal of ad revenue. And this money can be used to hire reporters and to continue the outlet's work. Now, an outlet that loses a significant portion of its readership may have to lay off reporters or could even go under. Mm, you know, that's part of the wonderful part about the capitalist system. You know, if what you're providing is not palatable for the masses, shall we say, then either you change what you're providing or you're no longer able to provide because you're out of business. It's part of capitalistic system. Is it perfect? No. But hey, that's part of the rules. Now, at its peak, Fakeybook provided as much as 40% of Think, Pro Think Progress's traffic. And Fakebook recently changed its algorithm in ways that reduced the amount of traffic it sent to most news outlets, but it still accounts for between 10 and 15% of their readers. Okay, well, you're still getting readers. The difference between keeping those readers and losing them could decide whether we can hire more reporters who will continue to report on subjects that the Weekly Standard may have ideological disagreements about. Why should this stuff be censored in the first place? Why not just put a little, you know, it's like those little black boxes that they supposedly put on prescription drugs that are really, really bad juju. Like only take this if you want to commit suicide kind of drugs, which should be on every one of those pharmaceutical drugs as far as I'm concerned. But 
I digress. In any case, you look at this and you go, okay, the weekly, just put a little post on there. You know, the weekly standard doesn't like this, thinks it's false. And then everybody can go, oh, well, I think I'll check out Think Progress. Then I'll go check out the weekly standard. And then I'll decide for myself. But no, people don't do that. Silly people. Oh, well. Apparently, pa Facebook's push notification makes clear that any group that shares a piece that the Weekly Standard deems false could be punished for doing so. So what happens if all of those other f uh, fact checkers deem something false? Are you going to cry me a river about those as well? Think progress, honey. Cry me a river. I want to see it flowing. How's your flow? Yeah, these news outlets aren't the only players at risk under this system. As a legal matter, Fakie Book is treading on very dangerous ground by providing no oversight of its own fact-checking operation. You could say that, but once again, I say to you, Fake Book is providing you a service. And if you don't like the rules of engagement with that service, move along. There's lots of other social media outlets out there. Now, in its landmark decision in New York Times versus Sullivan, the Supreme Court held that an outlet can be liable for defamation if it publishes false information. With knowledge that it was false or with reckless disregard of whether it was false or not. Talk about vague and ambiguous. Man, that left that barn door completely open for every critter to get out and defecate all over everything. So by deferring to the weekly standards expertise and process, Fakebook acted with reckless disregard of whether the Weekly Standards article was false or not. And yet, are you not calling out Snopes? Are you not calling out factcheck.org? Are you not calling out PolitiFact? I'm sure they have done the same. Let's call them all out. Indeed, Fakebook's entire relationship with Weekly Standard appears driven by reckless disregard of the truth. Well... The truth can be quite um, malleable because what's true for you may not be true for me because I may actually have more facts available and maybe it may have more information at, in my access so that I can formulate a truth that is just a little bit more um, factual. <sighs> yeah, truth and factual. Yoinks. There really is quite the difference. Beetle! I see you, Beetle. How are you doing, hon? And yes, Grimmy, I do say fuck fake book. Although, then I have to pull that back just a little bit and say, mm, you know, I do have standards. There are certain things even I won't do. So... Uh, ta -da! Yes, Beetle, I wear glasses sometimes. Mainly to read up close things anymore. Distance vision, not so much. My distance is improving, but up close, not so much. Um, yeah, Grimmy. How, I wonder how much they're crying over Alex Jones's ouster. And he's he's been booted from all kinds of places. I actually, once in a while, Alex Jones comes up with something that I go, huh, hadn't seen it like that. Wow, now I'm going to have to ponder that a little bit more. I personally cannot stand listening to him. His voice makes me crazy. But... Oh, I love you too, Beetle. You're such a sweetheart. Um, let's see. <laughs> good one. Oh, Vinny, that's a good one. Let me check that out. Just because. Just because. Now, you know, they're with all of their lovely little fact. Oh, yeah. I'm going to have to like and follow that one yeah just because 
Oh, you can bet your sweet bippy. If I wasn't on their list before, I am now. Yeah, buddy. I love it. I love it. That's a good one. Okay. Now, seeing as how we're talking about faker, faker, belly acres, and, and no pride in war, and all of that other fun stuff, <sighs> let's check this one out. It's from mintpressnews.com. Another thing that I saw over on Twitter. Did you know, did you know, that Afghan opium production is 40 times higher since U.S. NATO invasion? That's about 90% of the world's illegal opium is estimated to come from Afghanistan. Did you also know that the Afghanis, a lot of times they grew tomatoes because they had very good soil for growing tomatoes, but it wasn't quite the cash crop. And when you get the warlords, note, war lords. Yeah, I'll take that, that lord's name in vain. Um, you get those people behind you. Yeah, you got all kind of people growing this shit. And then you got our military patrolling it. Wow, isn't that just special? So since the U.S. led NATO invasion of Afghanistan in 2001, huh, 2001, that wasn't too long after, um, or was that before 9-11? 2001, wow, what a bonus year, not... In any case, the production of op opium in that country has increased by 40 times. This is according to Russia's Federal Drug Control Service. And it's fueling organized crime and widespread death. And, you know, some of that organized crime is big pharma itself. Now, the head of the FSKN... Viktor Ivanov explained the staggering trend at the March UN conference on drugs in Afghanistan. Opium growth in Afghanistan increased 18% from 131,000 hectares to 154,000 hectares, according to Ivanov's estimates. Estimates? Hmm. Now, Afghan heroin has killed more than one million people worldwide since the Operation Enduring Freedom. <laughs> yeah, we're going to bomb some free dumb right India. Um, since it began, and over a trillion dollars has been invested in internet, excuse me, hiccup, international organized crime from drug sales. This is also according to Ivanov. So... Prior to the invasion of Afghanistan, opium production was banned by the Taliban, although it still managed to exist. And the U.S. and its allies have been accused of encouraging and aiding the opium production and the ongoing drug trafficking within the region. Oh, psst, that's one of those alphabet soup agencies that's doing that. Do I really need to tell you who it is? I think you know. al Qaeda. Ivanov claimed that only around 1% of the total opium yield in Afghanistan was destroyed and that the international community has failed to curb heroin production in Afghanistan since the start of NATO's operation. Why? Because whenever you have a war on something, you get more of it. It increases exponentially. So you have a war on drugs? Well, look at how many people are on drugs now. And I'm talking big pharma ones included. Those are just the legal ones. <clears throat> but whenever you have a war on drugs or a war on crime or a war on terror, you can bet your ass that it's going to increase like crazy. You know, freaking like rabbits breed, basically. Probably more prolific than that. Now, Afghanistan is thought to produce more than 90% of the world's supply of opium, which is then used to make heroin and other dangerous drugs that are shipped in large quantities all over the world. Opium production provides many Afghan communities with an income in an otherwise impoverished and worn torn country. Now, if we hadn't have gone over, I know this is a really big if for only two letters, it's a really freaking big word. If we hadn't have gone over there, if we haven't bombed them back into the Stone Age, which we quite, you know, you hear people say, and I heard, I still hear people say, 
bomb them back to the Stone Age. Honey, they're already there. We've already done it. Don't you think it's time we pull out and leave them the hell alone? Ah, oh, but nature abhors a vacuum. So they got to be there to keep it from sucking worse than it already does. I'm trying to figure out how that would happen, but I'm sure worse is standing on the sidelines going, Worse? Where? You, you rang? Oh, trust me. I can make it worse. You know, it's just like when you say to someone, how stupid can you be? They are going to take it as a challenge. There are some people that will. It's like, really? You challenging me? Is that a double dog dare? No, please don't. Wait, wait. You could be cleaning up the gene pool. Let me grab my beer. <laughs> oh, I'm so mean. Apparently, the op opium trade contributed to around 2.3 billion U.S. dollars, or around 19% of Afghanistan's GDP in 2009, according to the UN. That's some big moolah. Now, around 43% of drugs produced in Afghanistan are moved through Pakistan. That is also according to the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. And the Islamic State group is reported to have recently taken over opium production and trafficking. Why? Because it is so profitable. And the extremist group was estimated to be earning over one billion U.S. dollars from the opium trade. Profits also go into international drug cartels and money laundering banks. Well, isn't that what banks do? Yes. No, Grammy, I did not bomb Afghanistan. The we is the government and the mouse in their pocket, but we have we have a tendency to be collectively glumped in with that pile of shit. Basically because you know, we haven't disposed of them yet, but yes. Who is this we of which you speak? <laughs> wee, 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 all the way home. Um, ooh, Fluky, did you give Vinny some creepers? How funny. Okay. You know what? I totally spazzed off sharing those articles over here on um, realliberty.org because, well, you know, I'm a spaz. What can I say? Hi, Gary L. I see you over here on RLO. Awesome. Okay. Um, let me, let me, oh, now, see, now I've got damn ginger running through my brain from Gilligan's Island. Let me entertain you. Of course, it was Marianne that tried to do that, didn't she? When she thought she was ginger. I think that was that. And then she just kind of went crump. And poor ginger had to deal with all of these dresses. They were way too short because Marianne shortened them. Bless her heart. Hi. So, let's see. Um... Calling out. There we go. I had to get the fakey book one posted first. Because that is the order in which I'm going. And that way, if I should like faux pas and click the wrong thing. <laughs> which I know you're shocked. I know you are. Uh, but if I were to do that. Then this way I can go back to my page over here and I can go, oh yeah, oh yeah. That was the one I went to. So. Yeah, get both of those shared there. Yay. I'll put them over on the and site later because, yeah, I'm running behind. Well, I'm not running, but I'm behind. I'm behind her ender. Oh, and by the way, Grim, thank you ever so much for that never hold a fart in. <laughs> uh, that was one of those things that I had to put over on Fakey Book in my family page. Just to let everybody know, because we are, you know, when we have family reunions, there is an awful lot of hot air that gets dispensed, and it's out of both ends. So... <laughs> 
Just putting that out there. Now, seeing as how we've been talking about fakey book and talking about opium, let's go over here to worldtruth.tv because you know what? They say that 15 reasons why tequila is actually really good for you. Hmm. And here I just always thought tequila made my clothes fall off. <laughs> Apparently, there is no doubt that when people like their tequila, they really love it. So when it comes to this alcohol of choice, there really are no boundaries or limitations until you puke. And then I've known people that have gone back for more. It's like, wow, really? Obviously, you took that how stupid can you be as, as a challenge? Obviously. So <clears throat> as the Pringles campaign so eloquently put it, once you pop, the fun don't stop. So, you know that group of friends that, who can never decide what type of round to buy at the bar? Well, these people spend their time arguing between Jameson, vodka, and fireball. I don't do shots of anything. <laughs> Yes, it was, Grammy. It was really funny. So, um, in any case, but do you know that the one suggestion that will shut them the fuck up is tequila? Tequila shots. Yeah, I mean, people went as far as creating deep fried tequila that will actually get you drunk. What? So do you see people doing that with vodka? I think not. Well, you know, I keep vodka around because it's multi-purpose. And yeah, once in a while I do have a drink with vodka in it. But for the most part, it's really good for cleaning things. Much better than rubbing alcohol. So get ready to open your eyes to the benefits of tequila, some of which you've never even thought could be possible. Number one, it helps lower blood pressure. <laughs> Probably gets you comatose if you do enough shots. So how exactly is that possible? Well, agavian, which is the sugar that comes from the agave plant used to produce tequila, triggers insulin production and therefore lowers blood sugar. We can thank our friends at the American Chemical Society for that one. It aids in weight loss once again. <clears throat> you do too many tequila shots, you puke, and there you go. Got no calorie intake going on. Yeah, you heard me correctly. There are certain components in tequila that can help you lose weight. And in further tests done by ACS, tequila helped overweight mice lose a significant amount of pounds. Now I'm wondering, did they also do the little bit of salt on their little mice paws and take a bite of a lime or a lemon? after doing their tequila shots. I'm just curious. It's hard to picture mice that are drunk on tequila. Hey, Speedy Gonzalez. Hey, no wonder. <laughs> Number three, you don't really get a hangover. <laughs> bullshit. I call bullshit. <clears throat> but they say you may quickly disagree, but we're not talking about that shitty watered down tequila most people are accustomed to. Rather, to, we are discussing real 100% pure agave tequila. So try drinking this instead and see if that headache becomes a memory of the past. No. No. Actually, my sister-in-law, Breda Choey's wife, really likes her high-dollar tequila. And when we were doing a toast to my Auntie Wanda last year, out of all of the things that she had in there, tequila was the only thing that I went, okay, I'll try a shot of that. And whew, took me all night to sip that bad boy down. <laughs> it's like, whoa, whoa. And it hit. Well, when it finally hit, it hit. Number four, you can drink it straight without wanting to throw up afterwards. And I no. Now, have you ever tried throwing back shots of vodka? Actually, I have, and although it's not exactly pleasant, um, unless you try the flavored vodkas, try cinnamon vodka. That's not bad. So chances are it's coming right back up. But when it comes to tequila, you can rest assured that it will sail smoothly down your throat. Who wrote this shit? Y'all have not, man, you don't know some of the people I know. 
I've seen people woofty right after doing a shot of tequila. It ain't pretty. It ain't pretty. Out the nose and... Wow. <laughs> okay. Number five. It helps fight cholesterol. Hmm. Okay. So let's get scientific for a moment. Increasing the fiber in your diet helps in the reduction of cholesterol levels. Like fiber, agavins lower triglycerides in the blood and levels of cholesterol as determined by researchers at Plant Foods for Human Nutrition. Still not going to... Now, okay, I do, have to, I do have to put this out there. I do like a strawberry margarita every once in a while. <laughs> once in a while. Yes, Grimmy, I am. I am a cheap drunk. <laughs> okay. So, you know, frozen strawberry margarita with salt on the rim. Yeah, I could do that. Or even just a regular margarita. Frozen margarita with salt on the rim. But one is my limit. It's one and done. And if I don't have something to eat along with it, it's definitely one and done. Somebody better drive my ass home. <laughs> so... Number six, tequila may be used to help treat colds. Well, uh, just about any alcohol can be used for that. Back in, in the 1930s, doctors in Mexico used to promote this tequila concoction to fight off the common cold. Half an ounce of tequila blanco, half an ounce of agave nectar, and half an ounce of fresh lime juice. Hmm. That actually doesn't sound too bad. I'll bet it tastes way better than NyQuil. Number seven, it helps to numb the pain. Uh, duh, why do you think most people drink that kind of stuff? <laughs> okay. That wasn't too grimy? Oh, it was Vinny. Sorry, Graham. I blamed you and it was Vinny. Yes, Vinny, I am a cheap drunk. Okay, back to, okay, it helps you numb the pain. Tequila has been proven to dilate, um, dilate the blood vessels, which results in better blood flow, minimizing pain levels. When it comes to emotional pain, you can bet tequila is a remedy for that too. Yeah, it makes you so freaking drunk, your clothes falls off. Number eight. It can serve as a drug delivery system. Oh, yeah. There you go. Let's advertise that one. So, basically, when drugs are taken, the acid in your stomach typically breaks them down before they can even hit your intestines. So, why is this a problem? Well, because it decreases the drug's effectiveness. Tequila serves as a protective barrier of these drugs as they work their way into your system. Now I know uh, there's going to be people out taking, taking their pep and their pills, chasing it with a shot of tequila and going, there, now it'll really twink. Good job there. Number nine, diabetics can indulge too. The high amount of sugar that is present in alcohol is what poses an issue for diabetics. The thing with tequila, however, is that it is, or that it has significantly less sugar, and therefore it will have much less of an impact on the blood sugar. Okay, if it comforts you to think so. Ah, thanks, Vinny, for that shot of tequila. It'll just sit right there. <laughs> oh, poor beetle. Damn it. Okay. Uh, number 10, you look like a damn badass on a first date. Okay, that, yeah, if you can do a shot of tequila properly, yeah, you do look badass. Till you fall over. <laughs> so how many times do females worry about what to order on the first date? I only know this because I've had countless conversations with friends on whether or not it's appropriate to order anything but wine. I don't do wine either. Long story, but I don't do it. The answer is, order tequila and stand out from the crowd, making a long-lasting impression because you can be certain he will always remember you as the girl who ordered tequila on the rocks on your first date. Mm, no, no, not on the rocks. Number 11, it won't make you feel as fat as vodka or beer. You know, vodka doesn't make me feel fat, so I don't know what you're talking about here. 
Raise your shot glass and cheers to this because tequila helps to regulate the absorption of fat in your intestines. When it comes to alcohol, everyone knows how much drinkers detest bloating. Well, I think just about anybody detests bloating. Number 12, you don't have to waste your calories on a chaser. I do. One of the best parts about ripping shots of tequila is that you don't need soda to chase them with. Honestly, you don't really even need a chaser because the taste of tequila is that good. But if you really can't stomach it, there's always limes. No, no, the taste really isn't that good. Sorry. This is this is an opinion here, and it's not mine. The opinion the opinions expressed here do not necessarily correlate with mine. <laughs> Number 13, everyone respects a person who rolls up with a bottle of tequila to the pregame. No, everybody roots and cheers because it's like they know they're going to have a drunk time in the old town tonight. Yeah, there's always those people who insist on bringing a bottle of Fireball to every pregame they go, um, they, that they go to. And the word we use to describe this, these people is basic. Really? Although I can't do fireball shots either, so what the hell. Apparently a unique individual busts out the tequila and really gets the party started. Yeehaw. Number 14, it cleans your colon in a different way than you may think. <laughs> I know what I was thinking. <laughs> so... Touching upon the points found in eight researchers at, um, at Mexico's University of Guadalajara, they claim that blue agave found in tequila helps deliver drugs to the colon, which helps to treat illness such as Crohn's disease, colitis, IBS, and even cancer. And here I thought it had something to do with projectile poop. <laughs> and finally... It chills you out and helps you sleep. Now, I will admit that, yes, it does do that. Everyone knows that tequila and relaxation go hand in hand. You don't need to drink an excessive amount. One or two shots will do. Next time you can't fall asleep, try a sip of Don Julio. Don Julio! No, thank you. No. Nope. Hootie Doody Whitey committed three felonies today. Yes, everyone that is alive and breathing has committed three felonies. Minimum, just waking up in the morning. Okay, let me put this over here on the RLO because you know there's going to be someone over there that's going to go, Really? Dude, where's the Don Julio? Uh, Don Julio's been working on my roof, actually. <laughs> oh, I don't know if it's Don Julio, but yeah. I've had a lot of salsa music to listen to the last couple of days. Let's put it that way. Ha ha! <laughs> and you know, it's actually not bad. But, what the hey? Oh, man. There. I had to type it right. By gosh and by golly. By garsh. Um, oh, the storm keeps weakening. That's awesome. Awesome. Okay. So, I've gotten to To Kill You, Fake You Book, Afghan... Let's see. Now I had a couple of things in my pocket that I wanted to get to. Here we go. Um, from the New York Times, of all places. It's from February of this year. So, I needed a sip of my ginger beer. Free speech and the necessity of discomfort. Ah, let's see if I, if I agree with this one. This is the text of a lecture delivered at the University of Michigan on Tuesday, and the speech was sponsored by Wallace House. Now, I'd like to express my appreciation for Lynette Clementson 
and her team at Knight Wallace for hosting me at the Ann Arbor today and or hosting me in Ann Arbor today. It's a great honor. And I think Knight Wallace is a citadel of American journalism. And Lord knows we need a few citadels because journalism today is a profession under several sieges. Most of it is self-inflicted. Huh. So, there is an economic siege, particularly the collapse of traditional revenue streams, which has undermined the ability of scores of news organizations to remain financially healthy and invest in the kind of in-depth investigative enterprise, local and foreign reporting, that this country so desperately needs. There's a cultural siege as exemplified by the fact that a growing number of Americans seem to think that if something is reported in the so-called mainstream media, it is ipso facto untrue. Well, I kind of sort of agree with that. <laughs> There's a technological siege, which not only has changed the way we work and distribute our work, but has also created a new ecosystem in which it is increasingly difficult to distinguish fact from opinion, clickbait from substance, and real news from fake, or what I like to call spewage. Then, need I even mention it? Oh, here we go. There is a popo of the USA. We are all familiar with the ways that the, Tronel, the Donald Trumpel-Stilskin's demagogic assault on the press has already normalized presidential um, mendacity, mainstreamed alternative facts, and desensitized millions of Americans to both. I'll get to him in a moment. Oh, goody, it's going to be a Trump basher piece, too. Well, this should be fun. So, there is also a fifth siege. And this is the one I want to focus on today. This is the siege of the perpetually enraged part of our audience. There's no small thing when it comes to the health, reputation, and future prospects of our profession. Journalism, by its nature, must necessarily be responsive to its audience, attuned to its interests, sensible to its tastes, alert to its evolution. Fail to do this, and you might not survive as a news organization, never mind as an editor, reporter, or columnist. Now, at the same time, journalism can only be as good as its audience. Intelligent coverage requires intelligent readers, viewers, and listeners, which is part of why they have been working so hard to dumb down the masses. We cannot invest in long-form, in-depth journalism for readers interested only in headlines, first paragraphs, or list... list ickles? Okay. We cannot purchase the services of talented wordsmiths and expert editors if people are indifferent to the quality of prose. We cannot maintain expensive foreign bureaus if audiences are uninterested in the world beyond our shores. We cannot expect columnists to be provocative if readers cancel their subscription the moment they feel triggered by an opinion they dislike. In sum, we cannot be the keepers of what you might call liberal civilization. I'm using the word liberal in its broad philosophical sense, not the narrow American ideological one. If our readers have illiberal instincts, incurious minds, short attention spans, and even shorter fuses, and you know the only way you change that is by feeding people things that make them think. They will eventually start learning or they will expire. One of the two. Apparently an example, last November, the New York Times published a profile of a 29-year-old Ohio man named Tony Hoviter. And Mr. Hoviter is a welder from suburban Dayton. He's happily married, middle class, polite, plays drums, cooks pasta, and loves Seinfeld. 
He is also a proud and avowed Nazi sympathizer. Wow. He started out on the political left, moved over to the Ron Paul right, and ended up marching with the anti-Semitic white nationalists at Charlottesville. He doesn't believe six million Jews died in the Holocaust, and he thinks Hitler was kind of chill. Well, yeah, he definitely got put on ice. Now, the profile by Times reporter Robert Fawcett was a brilliant case study of Hannah Arendt's banality of evil. Hovart, oh, Hovater is not a thug, even in his idea, or even if his ideas are thuggish. Not a monster, even if he takes inspiration from one. Not insane, even if his ideas are crazy. He reminds us of a diabolical ideology gains strength not because devil propagate it, but because ordinary men embrace it. And he warns us, as Bertolt Breck put it after the war, the womb is fertile still from which that crawled. Mm, yeah. Lest anyone doubt that Fawcett and his editors at the Times think of Hovart or Hovater and his ideas, the article was titled A Voice of Hate in America's Heartland. Now, this is not, to say the least, a neutral way of introducing the subject. And how in the hell is Ohio the heartland? That's frickin' east of the Mississippi. Heartland is supposed to be central, like where I'm at. You don't see a whole hell of a lot of neo-Nazis out here, or at least I don't. Yet... That did not seem enough for sometimes readers, who erupted with fury at the publication of the article. Nate Silver, the Times' former polling guru, said that the article did more to normalize neo-Nazism than anything I've read in a long time. And an editor at the Washington Post accused us of producing long, glowing profiles of Nazis, when we should have focused on the victims of their ideology. Maybe you should do the Nazis one time and the victims the next time. Or maybe incorporate both of them into one. That way you can't wax on about either ideology too much. Now the Times followed up with an explanatory and somewhat apologetic note from the national editor. No doubt... There may have been ways to improve the profile. There always are. But there was something disproportionate, not to say dismaying, about the way that some or so many readers rained scorn on the Times' good faith effort to better understand just what it is that makes someone like Hovater tick. Well... He didn't feel comfortable in one place. He didn't feel comfortable in another. He finally found a little niche that he felt comfortable in. That works for everybody. I know it's crazy, but it does. So, just what do the reader, these readers think about the newspaper and what it's supposed to do? Well, a newspaper, after all, isn't supposed to be a form of mental comfort food. We are not an advocacy group, a support network, a cheering section, or a church affirm affirming a particular faith. Except, that is, a faith in hard and relentless questioning. Now, I, I actually agree with that first sentence there. Actually, first two sentences. Our authority derives from our willingness to challenge authority. Not only the authority of those in power, but also that of commonplace assumptions and conventional wisdom. Okay, you don't really have authority, but I, I like how you are willing to challenge authority. I don't have a problem with that. Do you really do so? To carry on, he says, in other words, if we aren't making our readers uncomfortable every day, we aren't doing our job. Yeah, you know, sometimes what you need to hear isn't exactly pleasant. But you got to hear it anyway. But you got to be ready to hear it too. 
Now, there's an old saying that the role of the journalist is to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. But the saying is wrong. The role of the journalist is to afflict, period. News is new, new information, new challenges, new ideas, and it is meant to unsettle us. I don't know that I would go that far. It's, it is meant to give the facts with as little interpretation, especially if you're doing like a news piece with as little opinion in there as possible. Op-eds are one thing, doing a news piece, and everything's got a slant to it anymore. Even what I put out there, it's got a slant because I'm a snarky heifer sometimes. So, <clears throat> it's a good thing to unsettle people. To be unsettled and discomforted is the world's great motivator. It is a prick to conscience, a prod to thinking, and a rebuke to complacency and a spur to action. Just like Dangleberry was a spur to action because it was like, I really was, for the most part, complacent. I mean, yeah, I was mouthy, but man, Dangleberry, just before he even got the Democratic nomination, I was going, people seriously listen to what he's saying. Don't just listen to the pretty little words he's putting out there. Listen to what he's saying and actually think about all the different things what he just said there can mean. But people don't do that so much. Now, when this author uh, says, I say what need to be, what we need to be making our readers uncomfortable, I don't mean we should gratuitously insult them if we can avoid it. Yes, don't call them stupid. But neither should we make an effort to play to their base biases or feed this or that political narrative. There you go. Don't be feeding political narratives, although y'all are very good at that. You're the propaganda trough. Or dish the dirt solely on the people that we love to hate. Or avoid certain topics for fear of stirring readers' anger, even if it means a few canceled subscriptions. Especially in an age in which subscribers account for an ever greater share of our revenue, publishers will have to be as bold in standing up to occasional, if usually empty, threats of mass cancellations for this, is, for this or that article as they were in standing up to the demands of advertisers in the previous eras. So, what he means by making readers uncomfortable is to offer the kind of news that takes aim at your own deeply held convictions and shibboleths, whatever that is. And there are people on the political right who don't like hearing that the correlation between firearms and homicides is positive, not inverse. But the positive correlation is what the data show. Some environmentalists may believe that genetically modified frankenfoods are bad for your health. But the overwhelming weight of scientific evidence tells us that they are fine to eat. Ah, <coughs> excuse me, which brings me to the, the whole thing of how many negative articles get published as opposed to uh, supportive articles published in medical journal, journals. Scientific evidence, my ass. You're only getting to see part of it. Frankenfoods are not good for you. Now, the truth may set you free, but first it's going to tick you off. This is why free speech requires constitutional protection, especially in a democratic society. I do not like democratic because that's a mob rule, but um, free speech may be the most essential vehicle for getting the truth out. But the truth, as anyone minimally versed in history knows, is rarely popular at first. Barely 50 years ago, it was unpopular truth that there was absolutely nothing unnatural about the love that went by the horrible name of um, miscegenation. What the hell is miscegenation? I don't even want to know. 
Other unpopular truths one could mention include gay rights, women's suffrage, and evolution. These truths could only have made their debut in the public square and eventually gained broad acceptance under the armed guard, so to speak, of the First Amendment. Hmm, and you know, I, mm, I don't know that they're necessarily truths as they are publicly held be lifes, but eh, mincing words. But it's not just the First Amendment. In addition to a legal sanction, free speech has flourished in the United States because we have had a long-standing cultural bias in favor of the gadfly, the muckraker, the contrarian, the social nuisance. I like that contrarian. I want to be a contrarian. Mary, Mary, quite the contrarian. <laughs> So, for over a century, editors and publishers and producers, at least the most enlightened ones, have gone out of their way to make allowances for oppo opposing points of view. They do so not because they have a strong conviction of their own, but rather out of a profound understanding that the astute presentation of divergent views makes us more thoughtful, not less and that we cannot disagree intelligently unless we first understand profoundly. They do so because they believe that social progress depends on occasionally airing outrageous ideas that on close reflection aren't outrageous at all. They hold firm to the conviction that moving readers out of their political or moral comfort zones, even at the risk of causing upset, is good for mind and soul. Ultimately, they do so because we will not be able to preserve the culture and institutions of a liberal republic unless we are prepared to accept, as Judge Learned Hand put in 1944, that the spirit of liberty is the spirit which is not too sure that it is right and must therefore have the willingness to listen to the other side. This is what Adolf Oakes knew in 1896 when he promised that under his stewardship the New York Times would invite intelligent discussion from all shades of opinion. The Times, like other papers, may not have always lived up to that promise as well as it might have done, but as some of you may have noticed, it most emphatically is now to the loud consternation of many of our readers. Now I do my best to appreciate the concerns of these readers and I understand that many of them, many of us, believe the 2016 election marked a political watershed in which liberties we have taken or we have long taken for granted are being attacked and possibly jeopardized by a popo whose open contempt for free press has new, few precedents in American history. He has an open contempt for the mainstream media. There is a difference between an open contempt for the mainstream media and for the free press. We haven't had a free press in decades. I had to throw that in there. Now, I understand the justifiable fear these readers have for a White House in which a truth is merely optional in which normal standards of courtesy and decency have lost the purchase that they previously had under Democrat and Republican administrations alike, uh, if Trump or Stilskin wasn't the first one to issue in that kind of nonsense. Just saying. I also understand that these readers see the New York Times as a citadel, if not the citadel, in standing up to this relentless assault by the Popo and his minions. Popo. I shouldn't call him Popo, although he is kind of sort of a poo-poo Popo. He's the POTUS. Now, the speaker thinks they're right. The country needs at least one great news organization that understands that the truth is neither relative nor illusory nor a function of the prevailing structure of power, but also that the truth is many-sided. Yes, it is. That none of us has a lock on it. That is true and that we can best approach it through the patient accumulation of facts and vigorous and fair contest of ideas. 
Booyah, I agree with that. Excuse me, another belch. That, at any rate, is what I think we are trying to do at the Times. Okay, pat yourself on the back. And I can only hope that more people will see its virtue as time goes by. That obviously demands good and consistent communication on our part. But, to return to the theme of today, it also requires intelligence on the part of the readers. So how can we get our readers to understand that the purpose of the Times <clears throat> excuse me, is not to be a tacit partner in the so-called resistance, which would only validate the administration's charge that the paper is engaging in veiled part partisanship rather than straight-up fact-finding and truth-telling. Some readers, for example, still resent the times for some of the unflattering coverage of Hillary Clinton throughout the campaign, which she most rightfully deserved as if the paper's patriotic duty was to write fluff pieces about her in order to smooth her way into high office. Duh. Again, do these readers comprehend that we are a business of news, not public relations? And does it not also occur to them per that perhaps the real problem was coverage that was not aggressive enough, allowing Mrs. Clinton to dominate the Democratic field in the 2016 despite her serious and often belatedly apparent shortcomings as a candidate. So as it is, <clears throat> it is not as if there is a great surfeit of pro-Trump news and opinion in the pages of the Times. I think that's a shortcoming of ours. We are a country in which about 40% of the voters seem to be solidly behind the president, and it behooves us to understand and even empathize with them, rather than indulge in caricatures. Donald Trump Stilskin became POTUS because millions of Americans, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, who voted for Barack Obama in 2012 voted Republican four years later. Those who claim this presidency is purely a product of racism need some better explanation to account for that remarkable switch. Now the deeper point, however, is that if one really wants to resist Trump, especially those of us in the news media, we might start by trying not to imitate him or behave the way he does. The POTUS is hostile to the First Amendment. I don't think so. So let's be consistent and expansive champions of the First Amendment. The POTUS bel belittles and humiliates his political rivals. Uh, yeah, the, what other POTUS has not done that? So let's listen to and respect our detractors. The POTUS loves to feel insul insulted and indignant because his skin is thin and it thrills his base. Let's hold off on the hair trigger instinct to take offense. The president accuses first, gathers evidence later. Let's do the opposite. The POTUS embraces ugly forms of white identity politics. Let's eschew identity politics in general in favor of old fashioned concepts of citizenship and universalism. Uh, that's a whole nother. Ballywick as well. I could go on, but you get the point. The answer to the politi to a politics of right-wing illiberalism is not a politics of left-wing illiberalism. It is a politics of liberalism, period. This is politics that believes in the virtues of openness, reason, toleration, dissent, second-guessing, respectful but robust debate, individual conscience and dignity, a sense of decency, and also a sense of humor. In a word, enlightenment. It's a capricious politics, with plenty of room for the editorials of, say, the New York Times and those of the Wall Street Journal, and it is an uncomfortable politics because it requires that each side recognize the rights and legitimacy and perhaps even the value of the other. 
The nomination and election of Trumple Stilskin was, for me, the author of this, speaker, the plainest evidence of the... Ex- the extent to which the liberal spirit has withered on the political right. I've written and spoken about this phenomenon many times before, so I won't get into it here. But what worries me is the extent to which it is equally prevalent on the political left. Case in point. Last month, I wrote an article under the title, A Modest Immigration Proposal, Ban Jews. Now, the word modest might have been a tip-off to modestly educated or, yeah, modestly educated readers that I was not, in fact, proposing to ban Jews at all time. Now, my point was to note that Jewish immigrants of a century ago, including my own ancestors, faced the same prejudices that modern-day immigrants from shithole countries face today, and yet went on to great success. In other words, it was a pro-immigration piece, in line with the many other pro-immigration pieces I've written for the Times. But social media went berserk. Why? Because it was headlines. I was called a literal Nazi, guilty of garden variety bigotry. Others accused me of giving aid and comfort to neo-Nazis, even if I wasn't quite a neo-Nazi myself. A great deal of reaction was abusive and obscene. By now, I'm sufficiently immunized to the way social media works that none of this hurts me personally, at least not too much. And at its best, platforms such as Twitter are useful for injecting more speech from a vastly wider and more diverse variety of voices than we ever heard from before and it adds them into our national conversation. So what bothers me is that too many people, including those who are supposed to be the gatekeepers of liberal culture, are using these platforms to try to shut down the speech of others, ruin their reputations, and publicly humiliate them. How many people bother to read before they condemn? Are people genuinely offended? Or are they looking for a pretext to be offended? Because taking offense is now the shortest route to political empowerment. Am I, as a columnist, no longer allowed to use irony as a rhetorical device because there's always a risk that bigots and dimwits might take it the wrong way? Can I rely on context to make my point clear? Or must I write in fear that any sentence can be ripped out of context and pasted on Twitter to be used against me? Is applauding Pravda-like earnestness of tone and substance the only safe way going forward? Perhaps the most worrisome question is, to what extent are people censoring themselves for fear of arousing the social media frenzies? There's a reason why Katie Ralphie is writing about the whisper networks of women who aren't 100% in line with the Me Too movement. It should profoundly alarm anyone who cares for Me Too that such a piece should have needed to be written in the reliably liberal pages of Harper's Magazine, no less. The job of Me Too is to put a firm and hopefully final stop to every form of sexual predation, not to enforce speech codes. This move towards left-wing illiberalism is not new, and the list of thinkers who have waged war against that illiberalism, from Arthur Schlesinger Jr. in the 1940s to Christopher Hitchens in the 2000s, amounts to a roll call of liberal honor. I think we are awaiting our new Hitchens today. In case any of you want to apply for the job, all you need is a first-class brain and a cast-iron stomach. So where does this leave us? Well, I gave this little title, Free Speech and the Necessity of Discomfort, yesterday morning when I retweeted Knight Wallace's tweet advertising this speech, and someone wrote, Man, I hope he gets shouted down at some point. 
Maybe he was being ironic. At any rate, I'm happy to note that none of you has shouted me down so far. I trust that's because you all recognize it. Even if I may have said some things that made you uncomfortable and with which you profoundly disagree, there is a vast difference between intellectual challenge and verbal thuggishness, between a robust and productive exchange of ideas and mere bombast, between light and heat. It's fair to say that Americans of different ideological stripes feel that many things have gone profoundly amiss in our social and political life in recent years. We all have our diagnosis as to what those things are, but one of them, surely, is that we are rapidly losing the ability to talk to one another. Now the POTUS has led the way in modeling this uncivil style of discourse. I don't think the POTUS led the way. I think it was there way before Trump Stilson got in there, and that's part of why he got in there. <clears throat> but he has plenty of imitators on the progressive left who are equally eager to bully or shame their opponents into shutting up because they deem their ideas morally backward or insufficiently woke. So as each side gathers round in their respective echo chambers and social media silos, the purpose of free speech has become increasingly more obscure. Its purpose isn't, or isn't merely, to allow us to hear our own voices, or the voices of whom we already agree. It is also to hear what other people, with other views, pro often anathema to ours, have to say. To hear such speech may make us uncomfortable, as well it should. Discomfort is not injury. An intellectual provocation is not a physical assault. It's a stimulus. Over time, it can improve our arguments and sometimes even change our minds. In either case, it's hard to see how we can't benefit from it if we choose to do so. So make that choice. Democracy is enriched if you do, and so are you. And I, I would beg to differ on the democracy is enriched because, once again, democracy is the bully pulpit. <clears throat> but sovereignty is enriched. Independence is enriched. I didn't agree with a lot of the things he said, but I agree with the premise of what he said. So... Yes, free speech is not there to, um, you know, ensure that you can keep speaking. It is also to ensure that the person who you vehemently oppose can keep speaking as well and show how that ideology is either something that maybe you need to consider or something that most definitely needs to be disposed of. So, Beth, you was drinking white lightning? I have had moonshine. There is someone out here that makes moonshine, actually. Do what? Holy carp. Okay, get that posted over here on the RLO site. And you know what? It is late enough. I need to go check out the pig. I've been finding some long ones lately. Holy smokes. And I make y'all, I drag y'all along with me, unless you turn off the volume. And that's okay, too. That is your option. So over here on PIGazette.com, where they most definitely exercise their right to free speech. And it is not a constitutionally granted one. 
Constitution put that, it is supposed to be in there to let the government know, you shall not pass, as Gandalf says. It is a natural right. It is not something that's granted by the Constitution. Contrary to what many seem to think. So, what is their pick of the day? Oh, good God, I love this one. You guys are going to love the picture. Pick, pig pick of the day. It's a good one. It's a good one. Okay, so the word of the day over here on the pig is five W's, anachronism. It's a relic from the bygone era. It's a cloak of objective, objectively deployed by press card packing moon bats when they're caught spewing propaganda. Like the emperor's new clothes, it's a figment of their imagination. Five W's? Anarchism. Ah, yeah. Anarchy doesn't mean what most people seem to think it means, basically because they have been programmed well. In the quotable quotes section, the academic community has in the biggest concentration, or has in it the biggest concentration of alarmists, cranks, and extremists this side of the giggle house. That's from William F. Buckley Jr. Wow. Why does that not surprise me? Yeah, that's what I thought too, Grimmy. That is a good one. <laughs> okay, so. Um, what is this? Dismal rate. Okay, dismal ratings for Moon Batty Miss America pageant. Now that the Miss America pageant has been fundamentally transformed by chairwoman of the Board of Trustees and opulent Me Too profiteer Gretchen Carlson dropping swimsuits and evening gowns in favor of feminist ideology, let's see how it performs for advertisers. The Miss America 2019 competition just plummeted 36% in TV ratings versus last year's record low performance on ABC. Oopsie. That previous record low was 5.4 million viewers. This year, it's 4.3 million tuned in. And they were rewarded with steaming piles of moon battery. So let's see. Miss Michigan, Emily Sioma, denounced her own state over the Flint water crisis that was in the news a few years ago and apparently still arouses the belligerent self-righteousness of lefties. Miss West Virginia, Madeline Collins, denounced Trump. Her state voted for him 68% to 26%. Miss Virginia, uh, Emily McPhail, really that's her name, wow, okay, representing the state that produced the most significant founding fathers, endorsed the respect, disrespectful antics that anti-American NFL players indulge in when the national anthem is performed. Okay, guys, I really got to... <clears throat> You know, the CIA, the Pentagon, the Pentagon, let's put it that way. The Pentagon asked the NFL to start doing that <coughs> because they wanted to drum up patriotism. <coughs> and actually, it is extremely patriotic to uh, be able to do that and say, I'm not disrespecting anybody who has, you know, who, who in their heart of hearts feels as though they are actually doing this for their country. They don't realize they're doing it for the banksters, but, you know, if they really, you don't want to disrespect them, you want to correct them. Um, I don't have a problem with people taking a knee. Fine, you want to take a knee, deal with the consequences of that taking the knee. You know you got a bunch of war, war drum beating, chest thumping people watching the NFL. So, deal with the consequences of taking the knee. But I don't have a problem with you taking a knee. I really don't. I don't have a problem with people not standing up for the national anthem. It's, it's a special song. It's a special song. And it's been used and abused to manipulate 
and steer a herd. So I don't have a problem with that. I do find it amusing that uh, Miss America pageant ratings have major suckage going on. And actually for Emily Sioma denouncing her state for the Flint water crisis. Yeah, that water crisis is still going on. So yeah, I can understand why she's denouncing her state as well. So uh, that was a, sorry, shouldn't, see, they have a right to their steaming load, and that's what I think. It's a steaming load, but eh, my opinion, their opinion, eh, mock snicks. This date in history, the 12th of September, 490 BCE, Athenians give Persians a memorable butt-kicking at Marathon. Messenger runs the 26 miles to Athens with the good news, delivers it, and then drops dead. Yoinks. That's called giving it all, by the way. This date in history, the 12th of September, 1880. Newspaper man, scribbler, critic, and one of Hambo's favorite wordsmiths, H.L. Mencken-born, has a few choice words for the doctor after the spank of life. This date in history, the 12th of September, 1910. LAPD goes co-ed with world's first female cop, Alice Stebbins. Horn dog mayor Tony Villar loves a woman in uniform and offers to show her his etchings. Okay. This date in history, the 12th of September, 1939. Mr. and Mrs. Waxman leave an indelible stain on humanity when they poop out the rat-faced turd named Henry. All righty. <laughs> and finally... This date in history, the 12th of September, 1953, JFK acquires a tasty ball and chain named Jacqueline Lee Bouvier, a modern-day Camelot at 1600 Pennsylvania Boulevard, or Pennsylvania Avenue, lurks over the horizon, and things are not going to be peachy soon afterwards, just saying. They will not live happily ever after. Nope. So, let's see. I don't know. I'm kind of, I'm looking at their. Okay, let's see here. What do they have here? Okay, so this is from their top story. Under Dangleberry, ISIS continued to cut a bloody swath through northern Syria and northern Iraq. Their style of warfare is vile and loathsome to an alarming degree. Children, including toddlers, are raped, then beheaded or cut in half. The women are gang raped to death. Other women are gang raped, then sold into slavery. And if you're not one of them, your death is going to be horrific. Today, ISIS is on the run with nowhere to hide. No, not necessarily. It's a bitter irony that Dangleberry's unconstitutional surrender to Iran reached critical mass on Capitol Hill on September 10th, one day before the 14th anniversary of the day Jihad Akazis ripped a hole in the heart of New York City, which Jihad Akazis didn't do it, they just got, they won the little spinning wheel of blame. Otherwise, rational adults keep making excuses for terrorism, and the excuses include imperialism, colonialism, and racism, but my favorite is global warming. So, the flight from objective reality in one vital area has leapfrogged over troubling and landed squarely on alarming. Thanks to a well-orchestrated or PR blitz, Islamikazis have been upgraded from gang-raping, child-butchering mass murderers, upgraded to what? Well, tragically misunderstood, peace-loving, true believers who are ill-served by a fatally flawed public relations department. They are apologists, assure us, and economic refugees whose livelihood has been obliterated by global warming. Why does that not surprise me? And yeah, I saw the global warming thing and I wanted to see the lead up to it. So that's kind of why I went to it. But uh, yeah, if you want to read the rest of it, it's the top story over here on PIGazette.com. So come on over and check it out. 
Now I'm going to go back to my pocket because I do believe I have one more thing that I might be able to get to before I run out of time. Um, no, I don't want to do that one. Let's see. Let's go here. From medium.com. See how long this one is before I really dive into it. I, I saw the headline. Eh, the headline grabbed me. The way you read books says a lot about your intelligence, and here's why. Let's hope it's not super de duper. It is super de duper de Peter T. Hooper de Long. Super de duper de, and then lots and lots of comments. But I want to see why. Real fast. This is why the smartest people in the world own tons of books that they don't read. Really? Huh. So if you love to read as much as I do, walking into a bookstore as an adult feels exactly like walking into a candy store as a kid, which, yes, I do understand that. I am that way as well, although I rarely walk out with anything because and because I would have buyer's remorse. So the shelves are lined with wisdom of humanity, insights that other authors have spent years refining, and it's all right there at your fingertips, condensed into a format that you can curl up with. So naturally, you pull out your credit card or press the buy now button and the books pile up on your shelves, in your bedroom, in your car, maybe even your bathroom. The most dedicated book addicts find space where there was previously none, which I do like that bookshelf built into the side of the stairs. That's pretty freaking awesome. So... <clears throat> And as the books pile up, so does your guilt. No, I don't have guilt over because I'll, I'll get to it one of these days. So if that describes you, here's some good news. Even if you don't have the time to read them all, overstuffing your bookshelves or your e-reader is good for you. Ah, go figure. So, let's see. Um... So, oh, she's got a bunch of smart reading hacks and all kinds of other fun stuff. So I'm just going to go ahead and share this with you. I thought maybe it would be something quick and easy. Oh, no. He, Michael Simons. Okay, sorry. He. Um, I do like reading books. <laughs> oh, Grimmy, I don't know that I want to see your etchings, baby. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, in any case, I am just about out of time. And uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and I'll put this over here as well, just on um, RLO, just so in case anybody is interested in reading the long spiel, which it is a long spiel. Um, I was hoping it wouldn't be quite so long, but eh. <laughs> it's one of those, I may get to it one of these days. <laughs> kind of like a lot of books I have. Okay, in any case, today is the day after. The day after. Wasn't there a movie like that? The morning after? Something like that. Yesterday had all kinds of 9-11 stuff. And I wrote a little, a little ranty blurby. Eh. It wasn't anything, but it, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to when you want to just express, but you want to express it in a format that where, you know, people will probably maybe actually get it. Um, but yesterday, before I started on my chores... I wrote, I remember that day, intently watching the TV, the look on my co-workers' faces, the shock, the confusion, fear, and immense sadness that we all felt. I remember the following days, the changing and conflicting stories from the news, 
the questions and the heartache of the survivors. The sight of the sky with no trails in it. And the late night candlelight vigils. I remember the weeks that followed. The testimony of the survivors and first responders. The speculation and solidifying of the official story. And the first twinges of something ain't right here. And the faint rumblings of the drumbeat of war. I remember the months that followed and the new government agencies, the loss of our liberties for your safety, the families with questions left unanswered, and the louder drumbeats of war. Oh yeah, I remember. As do the families and friends of those lost that day. And we remember the cover-ups and lies, the dismissive attitude towards unearthed facts, and the continuing unanswered questions. Just know, the truth will come out, because we remember. And my heart goes out to you, Amelia. She lost two uncles that day. So, it irritates hell out of me that we haven't gotten to the bottom of this yet, but I know we will. Because the truth, much like the sun and the moon, cannot be hidden forever. So thank you all for listening in this evening. I hope you have an absolutely amazing rest of your evening. I hope tomorrow is just equally splendiferous. I will be back on Friday for the Friday edi- Freaker Friday edition of the Rocket Chair. Also, check out Ponder Gander, noon Eastern time. Um, I believe it's noon, or is that 1 o'clock Eastern? I just, Vinny will be on Ponder Gander. Come and check on Friday. So until then. Y'all have an absolutely amazing rest of your evening. I know I said that again. And remember, I truly do love you all. And I wish you all enough. Good night.